one. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Daily Objective. And we're going to be talking about a topic near and dear to many of your hearts, education, specifically Montessori education. Please leave a like. Please start to super chat your questions now and um, hit that join button to become a member. We are here with a guy who, uh, what can I say? He, um, he's he got the actual website, MontessoriEducation.com. So uh, let's hear him out on this. It's Jesse McCarthy. Yep, that's right. So uh, can you tell us uh, your background vis-a-vis -vis education and Montessori? Yeah, so I've been in it for about 20 years. Kind of started off on a on a whim, just somebody needed a teacher in vocab, like the older kids, teenagers. And I went in there, had a blast. And I was young myself, still early 20s. So I kind of felt that I was with my own people, kind of, you know, and just loved it, loved teaching. Uh, developed up from there, ran fourth through eighth grade program, started to develop the history curriculum for a school, very focused on curriculum in the beginning. And then we had Montessori schools or Montessori classrooms, I should say, down the hall. Started realizing that, you know, 13, 14 year olds are that I'm teaching are less independent than some of these Montessori that are three, four or five years old. So it really started to shake me, you know, not just with my teaching, but with myself as well, got into Montessori. I was, I was known kind of to speak to parents about our educational philosophy. So started to dig into Montessori, teaching it to parents, at least explain the extent that I knew it, observing a lot, um, and then developing up. So I started to help run the school, became an exec on the team, and then went out and opened Montessori schools across the country and gave the talks. So I was kind of like the speaker on it. So that's kind of my development up. Okay. Now, okay, here's what I know about Montessori and I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm I'm hardly very knowledgeable about it. So I know like Ayn Rand who, for whom this network is named uh mm -hmm. endorsed it, which is ob which obviously, you know, uh makes me curious uh to learn more. It it teaches yeah, work of genius by the way. Rucka, which is for for I say that is I mean as you probably know reading her works, that's pretty insane that she said it's a work of genius. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's oh yeah, absolutely coming from her. And she not only was she uh, herself, obviously, very impressive, but um, to say the least, but uh, she was not uh, for, uh, not promiscuous with compliments, uh, in my understanding. <laughs> yes, um, that's why I thought I'd add that in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, basically, uh, my understanding is so like Montessori education teaches students how to think for themselves, like how to think rather than here's information and here's stuff for you to memorize. Um, like we, we, we need, need to get your mind active. We need to get you to focus mm -hmm. and sort of start practicing the thinking that life requires, that learning requires. And mm -hmm. it sort of gets students started on a path, on a journey that many people won't begin until much later or if at all. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting because you're, you're focused on the thinking. And I think at a core level, what we are in beings, right? Rational beings. Um, but it's, it can be, it can be a, a false kind of start to focus on the thinking, I think, because then we could just be sitting down and thinking like you and I could just be having these conversations. Oh, we're growing and so forth. But in Montessori, it's a lot about you. You can't grow by just sitting still. So it's a very active approach. So although the idea is to kind of build up your conceptual mind in a way, it's integrated, it's life. So if you're sitting there just thinking, I'm supposedly learning all this content, building my conceptual framework, but you're not moving around the classroom. You're not learning how to interact with other human beings in that classroom. You're not taking care of yourself physically. So not just like reading Shakespeare at you know 10 years old, but hey, can I, can I wash this classroom? Like these tables I work on, does somebody just come in and take care of them? And I have no clue how it gets done, but they're clean. Or do I know how to take my environment? So that's all part of developing the mind and the person. So in mm -hmm. Montessori. Is it, is it a common Montessori thing to have like little, very young students have like their own, like mini tables and chairs and stuff like that? Are yeah. you, is that, is that a common thing? Yeah. Sure. So in a Montessori class, if you're thinking about a traditional classroom, with obviously the teacher in the front and there's kids in the desk, which I taught for years. I mean, there's amazing elements of that, but what you're referring to is, yeah, there's individual desks where at a young age, say three to six, a lot of it is very individual. Like it's, it's one child work, but very focused, the kind of work that like when we're at our best or whatever we do, you know, Rocky, you're making these videos, you know, me doing my work, I'm focused, man. It's like, it's me and the computer solo. 
And there's a lot of that time for the young kids. As kids get older, they really do like to collaborate on some of their work that we've seen just developmentally. So you see more smaller group work, still individual work, a lot of it, but it's more small group, but you'll never, almost never see a bunch of chairs, everybody learning the exact same thing, exact same time with, you know, me, the energy teacher up front, just like filling their minds with stuff. Like you just don't see that. Mm -hmm. Um, Man, so because of my interest in Ayn Rand, I've come across a handful of lectures and and, uh, courses related to education because, you know, so many of Rand's students um, are interested in Montessori or or like offshoots of Montessori. And so I don't really seek out uh, like education related content a lot, mainly, I think, because I don't have kids. So it does. It's not the first thing I'm, I'm seeking out. But whenever I do come across the type of thing that you're talking about, I always end up thinking to myself like, man, I was cheated. I was cheated out of this. <laughs> like and I yeah. should really be reading this stuff now. Like I should be basically reading Montessori, reading whatever, like, uh, consuming this, like this type of theory, uh, to kind of maybe retrain myself or something. So there, those are some thoughts I've had. Um, when you discovered Montessori, any, any similar or any, any type of. Yeah. I think that's, you know, in, in knowing them is going to come on here. They're like, Oh, this guy Ruck is going to interview. And I don't, I mean, I don't really know you. Well, I don't know this whole um, Ayn Rand UK, you know, I follow ARI, um, have friends that work, worked for ARI in the past. Uh, but I saw one of your videos, I think it was, I'm an objectivist or something like that. I, you know, why I'm coming out as an object, something, something of that nature. Maybe it's um, why I began calling myself about, an objectivist. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. So, and you talked about your own kind of personal development. I'll say like, I, I mean, I ran, I found her about 17, 18 years old and, and she's the foundation or at least objective is the foundation of kind of my life. But man, Montessori, it was one of those other switches, because as you were saying, like, realistically, you don't have a child. I didn't have a child when I got into Montessori. I was teaching. So there's a, there's a purpose there, but, and it really makes you rethink a lot of the stuff that you think you already know, you know, or you think, oh, I think I'm pretty good. I'm grounded this, but are you really that good? Like, let's go back to childhood. So it may, it forces you in a way to go back to that age. Um, so I highly recommend, even if you're not having children, read Montessori. I mean, the depth of her understanding um, about human development. So I think of Ayn Rand as kind of she understands conceptually like how we build concepts and so forth. What Maria Montessori says is let's go all the way back. How do we develop from zero up? I mean, her re- I would say her real focus was three to six. That's where she shined, but all the way back to childhood, because it's really important to see what goes on in those ages, you know? So I, I highly recommend it on that end for adults. Even if you have kids, you don't have kids. Yeah, it's a great idea. Uh, Mary Lean, thank you for the super chat, Jeff as well. And Mary Lean, then says kids love you. All right. Kids love you to clean things and prepare their own snacks. I, yeah. I that always blows my mind, by the way, maybe that yeah. you and the Montessori people can help me understand this. Why people who are super chatting that they don't proofread it before putting a dollar amount behind their comment. But no, we, we <laughs> love Mary Lean and all the super chats. Kids love to clean things and prepare their own snacks. They like to master their yeah. world. That's interesting. So uh, maybe cleaning doesn't need to be a chore. You know, maybe cleaning. Yeah, I reckon it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the the only other video I think I saw, I saw two other ones. One was the Dear White People, which I found funny. But the Jordan Peterson one, um, it was was funny to me. It was like, clean your bedroom, right? And he's he goes off about clean your bedroom. But with children and with us, like it kind of is like either it's this hardcore traditionalist, like do your clean your bedroom. And then, you know, you, you, you've got your bedroom clean, like you're a Marine or it's the kind of progressive, Oh, if the child wants to throw crap on the walls, who cares? Let him be. So Montessori says children love to do adult activities. So if, if you're cleaning around the house, invite them to clean with you. And it, and it's not just this, Oh, now they can clean on their own. They're developing their sense of self. Oh, I'm, I can be efficacious. I don't need this adult next to me. I can vacuum. So there's a real, I think there's a real sense that's lost. If we think of this as just like, oh, we're cleaning the room or we're helping with dinner. It's no, I'm building myself. I'm building the kind of person I want to be. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so what do you have any thoughts about someone like Peterson? You know, in one, in one respect, he's definitely, uh, I think he's reaching people that need the help. 
Um, but also, uh, you know, there's a lot that he's attaching to his message that I disagree with strongly, like religion, duty, uh, all types of stuff. But, you know, when he's saying, you know, yeah. clean your room, I've always liked that. I always it's like he's telling he's telling maladjusted people, just stop, stop with the self-pity and just start by cleaning your own space. And then you can worry about saving the world or, or fighting the dragon. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't go delve deep into Jordan Peterson, but I think we'll probably have some views about, about him, but the clean your room. I mean, I, can't, I think back, it comes even further back because a lot of Marines will say that in a very positive way, which I think are very positive. So I'm not talking about the kind of, you know, the, the super good Marine who's like, Hey, it's important to clean your room when you start the day. I think that's really good. Uh, I, I think it's great in the Peterson way is like, everybody wants to save the world today, but meanwhile, their room's a damn mess. So like, I think of it as like, start with yourself, you know? So that's where I come from with Peterson. What I like that he's kind of self-development now, is he doing that properly? And what's his foundation? Like we could, you know, I have some big disagreements, but that's the element that I like about him. But when it comes to children, the little I've heard him talk about children, he's very, very wrong. And I think in a dangerous way. Um, so he, and he calls children I mean, he's joking around and I can understand as a parent myself, he calls them little monsters. As, but there's something about him that he has a view that these are like, we need to, we need to change these, these beasts into human beings. And I don't have that view. So I think he's got a very pessimistic view of uh, children. That's a common thing uh, in, among conservatives like Dennis Prager has made similar points and, and many others like we're born evil and by evil, they mean selfish, like mm -hmm. we're born feeling entitled, right? A baby is a little monster demanding to be fed and taken care of. And exactly. there's just so much context being dropped with that uh, moral condemnation. But that then society, right, the environment, the, our teachers, our parents, everyone, they make us better. That's how conservatives see yes. it. Um, and on the flip side, you have this sort of like hippy dippy left, maybe leftist or whatever, just but like a hip, mostly hippie kind of view, which is like we're born innocent and society corrupts us. So maybe there's a, a grain of truth in both those views. But the correct view, I guess, would be we're born with no knowledge, with no moral stature. We're just born and mm -hmm. uh, we need help. You know, we can't like we need for, to be provided for as well as to be taught how to provide for ourselves. And moral, a moral, uh, a moral code is something that needs to be um, it, that's an achievement. That's it's something that needs to be developed and embraced. So uh, what yeah. are, you have any thoughts on the whole born evil? Yeah, I would say one thing that's pretty fascinating about it all that I've found that I haven't heard any really kind of, I think it's because we're so politicized where you've got to be either left or right, which I'm, I'm neither of the two is that conservatives tend to send their children to the most like do this now schooling. And then for adults, they talk about freedom. And then liberals talk about, quote, freedom for the littlest kids. And then for adults, it's let's have all these regulations. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a very interesting problem going on there. Um, but what I would say with that kind of dichotomy is, and this is Montessori's not fully clear on this. So I want to get, get it across. There's points in Montessori that she wrote a lot and lectured a lot, but she didn't put point A, B, C, now you have my philosophy. So in terms of how she views the child, I think there is some element of kind of Christianity and the child is an angel and he was born good type of thing. So it's kind of the opposite of the born evil. Um, but I think in talking about how she actually does in practice, I would say it's kind of more as you said, a child is, he's born as he is, let us look at him. Just as we look at reality to understand the world and better ourselves, if we wanna help children develop, we gotta first start and go, hey, who is this? What's this being in front of me? Just like we do in, in biology, you know, like in, in she, Montessori is a scientist. Maria Montessori is one of the first like female physicians in Italy. Um, and she said, let's look at the child. We're, we're getting all these theories popped in our head. Let's look at him. So if you look at it in that way, I, I say, we look at a child and say, what's he all about? How can we best aid him? And that's our foundation. Look at the child. Montessori would say, follow the child. That's what she means. She doesn't mean like, you know, if a child wants to run off a bridge, oh yeah, let's let's just follow the child. It means look at the child as a scientist would. Hmm. And now Marilyn uh, super chatted one ninety nine and said, "Crap, I do proofread. Still missed it." The <laughs> an emoji. Now, so in this case, shaming Marilyn worked and got us another super chat. Yeah, she's uh, what, an adult. You can shame. You can shame an adult. <laughs> Don't shame the, the child. But yeah, we'll shame Marilyn. That's no problem. 
So the Montessori approach is not to shame a child, not to single a child out in a kind of a cruel way. Yeah. And I've, I mean, I've had parents get these talks and, you know, every now and again, and it's not just to say that Russians are kind of tough people, but I, a lot of times I'll have a Russian dad come up to me and be like, you know, this sounds all good, but you're going to make my, my boy into a wussy. You know, he doesn't. And the reality is in great Montessori schools, not all the Montessori schools are the same, but if there's conflict, you don't just jump in and go, okay, everybody be kind to each other. Like that's, that's kind of the propaganda that you might hear from some Montessori schools and, and in some of the Montessori movement, but that's not actually the way it should be. And, and Montessori talks about it. it's let the children try to figure it out. If they try, if, if it gets violent, obviously you're going to step in. And then there's these things called grace and courtesy, which are lessons. Like imagine you're three years old. Well, actually I'll go, imagine we're at our age right now, Rucka, and we're in person and you walk by me and like bump my shoulder hard. You know, if I was a gangster, I just pull out my, my gun and be like, Hey, what you doing? You know, like something like that. But us, we would probably go, Oh, excuse me. You know, but we're adults. We've learned that at three, they don't know. So what Montes one of the other genius in Montessori, she said, okay, they need lessons on how to interact with other human beings. If somebody bumps into you, this, I, we, we literally will give a lesson, grace and courtesy. How do you, inter how do you react? So a three-year-old needs those lessons, learn, how do I interact when somebody takes something of mine, when somebody bumps me, when I want something, but there's only one material in the classroom, you can't get it immediately. So it's, it's just this, it's this full person development. That's not about just the you know, intellect, it's socialization too. It's everything. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. The, the question of like, is this going to make the kids soft or what? Like, you know, I grew up uh, in Jerusalem in a very, very secluded uh, Jewish religious uh, environment. So from like age mm. four, I was going to like all boys schools where like rowdy Israeli kids. I didn't speak the language. You know, they spoke Hebrew. Most of them, I, I spoke English. They, you know, they yeah. picked a bunch of them picked on me, you know, four years old, had no idea what the hell's going on. But like I've looked yeah. back and thought I'm just thinking like I can already see the comments. Oh, you got picked on. And no wonder you, you know, you're, you know, all the <laughs> haters are going to. But um. But I, I've thought to myself, like, would I be me? You know, would I be me? Would I have the uh, the grit? Would I have the drive? Would I have the even the independence uh, to make the you know to make the choices that I've made, which I think are mostly positive, um, but for that sort of adversity and that very um, kind of jungle experience? So yeah, obviously Montessori, you're not you're not putting these kids in the jungle. You're you're you're, you're giving them a much better and healthier environment. But like, I, I've wondered about this. Have you wondered about this type yeah, of thing? I yeah, Ruck, I think it's an awesome thought. I've had people rarely, but they asked me that. And I myself have definitely thought about that because I didn't come from Montessori and I didn't come from this very proper and, you know, functioning place. I mean, I, my, I love my mom and dad's good, but this was not, you know, a Montessori household and Montessori school. You know, I'd throw something back at you like Frederick Douglass. Is it better that he was a slave? Right. I mean, so the question really is like, yeah, Ruck, it's it's made the character you are, but, you know, I don't know. I, I did some, I don't have many regrets, but I look at the stuff I did and go, damn, man, if I could have, you know, that 12 years in, in traditional school when I was having fun, just fooling around that's 12 years of life. I mean, 12 years in a system that like I might've had one or two good teachers. And why was I out like senior year? I want to go out and drink because there's nothing better to do. They haven't shown me anything that's actually fun. So in learning wise, I'm talking about. So I, I'm with you that, yeah, I developed my character, but how much work did you have to do to even get to where you're at? And then still now stuff will pop up. That's like, wait a second, why do I care so much with that person thing? So yeah, like, that's kind of, that kind of BS. You don't want that in life. Mm. So I, I'm with you. I think, you know, there's always a trade-off, but um, what could you have been or what, what more advancement could you have made? So. That's yeah, that's true. And at the end of the day, we can't really change the past and we, we didn't get to choose all these things. So, yeah. So we don't, and we don't opt it for that type of uh, abuse or anything like that. We just yeah. try to do better for the next generation. Uh, Serrano in the super chat uh, with 279 Canadian says, talk about the child is the teacher by De Stefano. Are you familiar? Uh, yeah. So uh, this is a, this is a new book that, and so I haven't read it. I don't really, I'm not really interested in that book. Um, I don't think I, from what I've seen and I've seen reviews and so forth, there's nothing incredibly new 
out in it. And you can, what I like to do, this goes with Ayn Rand, this goes with Maria Montessori, this goes with Frederick, anybody that I'm interested in, in a deep way. I like to read them directly and getting somebody's interpretation when there's a lifetime of stuff to be read and lectures on. It's like, man, what am I going to do? Read this random woman. She's just, a. she didn't really d- dive deep into it. This is not somebody who studied this for years. I'm going to read her perspective over just, why don't I just go to the source? So that's my perspective on that book. But the the, so I don't have any kind of context to add to like what's good or bad about that book. But I, what I would say is go read directly of Miriam Montessori first. Start with that before you go get somebody's interpretation. All right. And Apollo with five pounds says, is there a, any relationship between Montessori and developmental psychology? Yeah, I mean, in the sense that developmental psychology is trying to understand how we develop as human beings and what's the connection with, you know, children, obviously. So I think in that sense, yes, I would say in the kind of classic, um, and this isn't, I mean, it's somewhat connected with developmental psychology, but the, you know, psychiatry and the old kind of, not Freud in the sense that we're somehow bad and so forth, but the idea of looking within and actually doing introspection, and there's a subconscious, and it's important to kind of do work to get clarity on what, you know, what's going inside in your mind. That part of psychology is hugely interrelated with Maria Montessori. Um, she was friendly with Freud's daughter. So there's a lot of integration there and, and Montessori is explicit about some of it. Mm-hmm. Now, Bonnie also super chatted and she said in Dr. Montessori's own handbook, she says, I think she, maybe she's quoting Rand, mm-hmm. uh, the Rand, quoting Rand, quoting Montessori. In Dr. Montessori's own handbook, the base of my method is liberty and the organization of work or freedom in a rationally prepared environment, freedom and reason like objectivism. Not sure how much of that is a quote by Rand or if that's Rand. But anyway, point being, so despite the fact that Montessori was herself a socialist, right? Just like Victor Hugo was a socialist and Rand swore by these people's work. So there are there are things I wouldn't say are like more important than politics in a, in a, in a way, but like more fundamental and kind of more important to embrace. So if, if Hugo was offering us a certain, um, attitude about life and what art can be, and then if Montessori is offering a certain approach to education and, and help aiding development of a child, that, that is, um, kind of more, should take priority or a higher in the hierarchy of values than let's say someone who maybe has the right economic policy or the right political approach yeah. at the moment. So I would say two things there. One is Maria Montessori was a socialist at one point in her life. She did mm-hmm. live through World War II. So she's she's not the kind of person that's like, oh, I want socialism no matter what happens to actual mm-hmm. human beings and so forth. So it's, it's important to note that. Um, and then second, I think what you were talking about politics is really important because when we hear freedom or liberty, we tend, particularly in America and then, you know, the broader world to think about politics first. But like what's most important is that we are free as ourselves. Like, do we understand ourselves? Do we have freedom to move around on our own? Like what's going on in the parental home? You might have political freedom, but your home is is a dictatorship at four years old. So that can really stunt your development. So by the time you want to talk about political freedom, you're, you're a big mess personally. So Maria Montessori uses a much broader sense of freedom regard. And I wouldn't think of it as, as, you know, when she says liberty or freedom, she's talking about politics. In fact, she did not think education was education or politics at a place with education. It was more in just the, you know, the classroom is for the child and the home is for the child, but we're not bringing in politics to, to force things, force change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we uh, we do. We have a lot of like discussions and explorations on this show about like who's a good guy in today's landscape and who's who should objectivists or fans of uh, students of Rand even uh, identify with in any way, have any common ground with. And and I've increasingly come to the conclusion that we go where there is respect for the intellect, where there are people thinking calmly and having sober discussions rather than rabble rousing and, you know, acting frantic. Um, so, and I think this, uh, yeah. approach to education or, or development is, uh, is similar. It's yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting you say that too, because if you read Ayn Rand and she has very little on education, but you know, Comfort Chico's is pretty forceful. She's being forceful about it, but she doesn't tell you, this is what exactly you need to do with education. 
Um, and when she says that Montessori's work is a genius or method, I think I take that very seriously. So I think objectivism historically, well, I've gained tremendously by say somebody like peak off, um, but it was focused on content. And the reality is at a core level, you know, I've met farmers who have raised themselves up from the farm to, to run serious organizations and content was not the strong, their strong suit. Their strong suit was that being able, to, being able to get shit done on their own and having a strong sense of self-esteem. So I think and I was in content for years and I love, I mean, I'm, I'm very you know, adamant about certain content, but at a core level, what we're doing here is helping a child develop a sense of self. Now you do that in, in, in large part through content, but I think in the objectivist movement, the content element has been highlighted and not by Ayn Rand, I'm saying, but overall. Um, in years past, and that was can be somewhat problematic because then it can be like, oh, if you let children be free, that's progressive. And it's like, no, there's an alternative. It's Montessori, and we should delve deeper into Montessori and understand it better, um, and then talk about education from, you know, a rational perspective. Mm -hmm. Jeff with ten dollars Canadian, thank you for that. Uh, Marilyn says, I agree about reading Montessori's own work first, but Di Stefano did so. He did do years of research. I recommend the biography. Fascinating. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to be an ass about it. I mean, hey, if, if you enjoy that book, there's all sorts of cool mm -hmm. books out there. I just have limited time and I've, I've been in this for 20 years. And I, I think, again, reading versus being in a classroom is just, you know, it, it's just a whole, I was a teacher. Like you, you go into a classroom and you got to like figure this stuff out with 20 different kids. That's different than reading a book about how do you figure it out with 20 different kids? It's just, it's life and death difference, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I respect, you know, I respect somebody who's been in the class and then talks about it, but it's much more difficult for me to read a book, spend time, me where I'm at development level on somebody who's talking about something that they've never actually done themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, now, since you, you dropped a couple light swear words, do you have a, a view of swearing and, and children or students like do you have an opinion i try to i try to swear as much as possible to get them exposed you know there you go no no but so i mean you know i it's tough rock i don't know what your world is but you know when you're always around children i think i tend to like have a few more curse words now because when you're around children not that i'm somebody different i'm i'm myself but you do kind you gotta i mean there's all sorts of topics you're not gonna raise with a four-year-old or even a 13 year old mm -hmm. So I, I find myself getting a little more loose and kind of calm with normal, with, with human beings, adults. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, sorry you, if I offended you, Rucka. Oh, no, it, it doesn't offend me, but it does <laughs> kind of uh, raise some questions. Um, so like, I, I still have this kind of, and, and this is an ongoing kind of um, thing I explore in my own introspective uh, moment moments. Like yeah. I still have this kind of religious um, attitude. And now, as, as you know, by, you know, doing some research on me, like I'm I'm hardly, you know, prude or like um, genteel in as an entertainer. But but I think it's rare to hear me swear, let's say, at a dinner party or in like polite society. So I, I think I, I kind of like separate things. And that's a big religious thing, especially yeah. the Jewish Orthodox Jewish. Everything's separate. The, the dishes are separate. The uh, you know how you you know what you do here, <laughs> what you, certain things you can't you can't pray in the bathroom like you can't. Yeah. Everything needs to be separated. The man, the man and wife sleep in separate beds when she's on her period or whatever it is like um, separating things. And I still kind of struggle overall with like this religious metaphysics, like um, yeah. like ra like rather than like uh, living inductively. But I mean, let, well, you, if you could comment on what I just said and, and I'll, I'll ask uh, I'll ask something else. Yeah. Or raise another. Right. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating is you kind of live two different lives because I saw some, you know, one of your videos on, you know, Rucka Rucka Ali, and then mm -hmm. I see these videos and it's like two, I'm like, it's <laughs> the same guy. So, so you're kind of in the culture with Rucka Rucka Ali, and then you're over in this objectivist world that generally, uh, generally, and I'm going to say past and so forth, that tends to be in its own little echo chamber. So I like that I found that you're bringing a certain culture into objectivism from the outside, at least from the few videos I saw. So with me, like when I'm around friends, it's not like I'm swearing all the time, but a swear word, word will come out when I'm around friends from high school. I mean, forget about it. It's just like we're having fun. So what I found in my work is that the more I'm myself and I'm talking about speaking to like 60, 70, 80 year old Montessorians have been in this for 40 years and then all the way to like a 20 year old 
woman who just started or a 20 year old guy that they're a part of the culture. They're hearing rap music cussing all over the place. So the more I'm just who I am and I was, I was brewed in this culture, you know, I, I was born in 81 and th this is some of it. So I don't look at it as like, oh, you're bad for using language. I look at it as what's fitting for what I'm trying to get across. And if it comes out, I say, you know, the F word sometime and I, I think it's wrong, then I'm going to be like, I really need to work on that. Like that's coming from a place I don't want anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I used to, when I first gave talks, Rock, I was out there in a suit and I'm very formal. All of a sudden it becomes a, like when people give talks, it's a different person. No, no, mm -hmm. I want you. That's why I'm here. I want the, I want you not formal Jesse. Mm, yeah. That's an interesting uh, thing as well. Yeah. Like, um, kind of the idea, like, I think acting is similar. Um, and we don't, we don't have our resident actor here today, but, um, what I learned in acting classes, which I took, you know, I'm not super trained like Pellegrino, but I'm, you know, I've taken some classes. The, our teacher, he would say, look at, turn on TV. How many of them are acting? You know, how many of them are playing a character? There's like one character mm -hmm. actor on the show and like seven people just reading the lines and they're, but they're trained at not letting the camera, um, make them, yeah you know, change them, affect them. They're, they're basically, yeah. they're comfortable just being themselves on camera and, you know, having the particular motivations or reading the lines. So it's, um, yeah. So like being as a, as a speaker, just being comfortable being who you are as a broadcaster is, uh, it's a, it's an achievement to be able to do that. Um, so when I say I'm like, I struggle with uh, religious metaphysics is, is, I mean, and like, the inductive approach is, you know, you observe, you, you conceptualize, you kind of learn things about the world and you, you only mm -hmm. kind of, uh, re, you only kind of, your, your mind only contains what you've actually observed. Like that, that to me seems like the, the proper way to develop and, and to live. But, but when you are, but when you're as a child, you're told, you know, there's a God and he went poof and the world was created and, and God is watching and changing, manipulating things. And like this sort of um, platonic dimension is as real, if not more real than the one you're observing. You end up kind of um, creating stories. OK, well, let's talk about that metaphysical aspect, if uh, if that raises yeah. any any thoughts in your mind. Um, yeah, that's something I struggle I with to this day. Yeah. And I don't, you know, it's getting into religion, especially in my, you know, my field, it's like, th that's such a long discussion and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. But kind of maybe to give an analogy, so I'm not riling up people on my end without having a full discussion about God and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can take Kanye West, now he's in the, you know, news and so forth. So he's, he's saying all oh, the Holocaust didn't exist and all this stuff or didn't happen. So I would say that there's a good percentage of people out there that think the Holocaust existed and they don't actually have evidence. Now, I, I clearly I'm, I've studied history for a long time. I've, I know it exists and I have evidence for it. But in the same vein, there's people out. So my my approach is, as you were saying, you want to learn things inductively. So there's people out there. Oh, my God, this is horrible. But if I ask them, well, how do you know? Oh, I saw a picture. Oh, well, can you source that? Well, source that it's a picture. So I think the that's where we go back to Ayn Rand and the conceptual framework. You need to know how do I know? I need to bring it all the way back to a ground level. So with Montessori, there's not just books in the classroom. Now it's important, great books are important as a child gets older, but in the beginning it's, let's take him out and look at actual trees. What, what does a tree look like? What are the parts of a tree? What are the parts of this little bug I see? And then you go study the parts in class and you might memorize them, but you've already seen the actual thing. So with history, now as Montessori gets older and older, I you know, it's not completely clear. Everybody does their own little tiny thing, but generally you would want to be able to source things. So at the end of the day, I'm not interested in what your take is on something unless you actually can ground it back in the real world for yourself. So that's, that's why I would say with that metaphysical approach with, you know, God, but the analogy here would be all of your work has to come back from reality, not from your teacher told you, not from my pastor told me, not from my mom told me, but how do you know? So that's, that's where I would say Montessori is it's the only approach I've ever seen. And it's Aristotelian explicitly. Montessori is a huge fan of Aristotle. And she says, whatever is in your mind first came from the senses. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it solves a big dilemma that you might have. You go back and work and look at Montessori because she has a lot to say from child on that development. Yeah. And I, I, I also wonder if I uh, was educated in an Aristotelian environment, would I have an imagination? That's kind of um, 
sort of another thing I kind of struggle with. Would I be like going, would my mind be going in all these places, but for all the fairy tales or, you know, tales I were told were, were as real as the air I breathe. Um, so I've, I've really, I've struggled with that. And, but I want to ask about stories in general. So everyone from mm-hmm. Ayn Rand to Jordan Peterson to various intellectuals that are attributed, affiliated with the left, you know, cons- constructivist, post this, post all, all mm-hmm. of them. I mean, going back to the ancient times and as far back, I think, as we can trace human existence, we see stories being a huge thing that people do. They tell stories. They they talk about the importance of stories. We see this everywhere. Stories, stories, stories. I find myself um, creating stories in my mind mm-hmm. in which sometimes I'm sort of mis, um, misintegrating. I'm like mis misdesignating like I'm take if, if somebody bumped into me in the street and I thought they were rude about it. Now they're the villain. They are, you know, yeah. they are the villain. They are everything. <laughs> and I'm the obviously the, the hero of this story the Um, and various yeah. people that have this like black and white view of people. Obviously, in reality, most people are mixed. Most people, you don't know enough about them to really judge what they're going through and and who they are morally. And and life is not a story in a in a certain respect It like it is, but it isn't because there's uh, we we decide what's essential. Like we decide what's important mm-hmm. individually. We decide what matters. And but um, like metaphysically, right? In the in the so called eyes of the universe, it's all kind of equally meaningful or meaningless, right? It's just a bunch of stuff happening. So the, that's those are some of my thoughts. Um, yeah. So I I didn't. Well, could you put something into a question form? I can hop on some yeah, of yeah. stuff, and if you want me to do that, I could totally. Well, do just that like stories. stories. So, like, how okay. do we how do we um, embrace the the significance of stories, but not end up um, yeah. writing these stories in, in our moments of passion that are basically yeah. de- detached from reality? I mean, I'm sure people fight get into fights all the time because they're living two different stories, and uh, you know, people they've got these stories that they're running with. So, I mean, a lot of that obviously goes into psychology. So Maria Montessori hits on some of this with children, but again, I think a lot of that is, you know, doing a lot of introspection and figuring out, well, why do I respond that way? Why do I have, you know, this, this rage when somebody cuts me off and do I, you know, do you even know if they really cut you off or they just, you know, they were reading a book or something, they're being stupid. But so I think there's a lot there, but in terms of the imagination and stories, I would say, uh, Montessori has a lot when children get into elementary where she teaches through stories. She starts with stories and then goes into more of an inductive approach. But the beginning is, I'm going to tell you guys a story. Because as human beings, we need to see concretes. I remember when I started teaching, I was like, to fourth graders, think about this, to fourth graders, the Greeks are the most heroic civilization. Because I had a little bit of objectivism, the, the movement, I'm not saying Ayn Rand, but the movement as um, my guide. So children need to know that the Greeks were heroes, but that's so abstract. But what if I tell a story about Caesar crossing the Rubicon? You know, like that, they're, they're like, oh my God, they're so excited. But when I was talking about these theories and morality and this abstract, they're just looking around like, what, what, you know, they don't care. So stories that are concrete, or you have somebody like Obama, they'll be like, you know, I was just talking with Bill down the street and he got a broken leg and he can't even see a doctor with his broken leg. And therefore, we should have socialized medicine. Like he just hooked everybody because he's got this one guy story. So there's something powerful for human beings about, and I think that goes back to your induction approach. I mean, they're they're falsely inducing there, but there is something, a sliver of truth in using induction to learn. So that's what I would say as kind of a, a and then just real quickly on your imagination. There is no such thing as imagination without reality first. You can't imagine something if you have nothing to imagine about. It does imagination doesn't come out of nowhere. So Maria Montessori talked a lot about this. We want to expose the children to the world reality first so that they can imagine like Victor Hugo, which she mentions actually. Mm -hmm. So she mentions a lot of people that Ayn Rand, you know, particularly Victor Hugo and then Aristotle. But the idea is that you can't truly imagine or create or so forth without first having a sense of reality. So I, Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a contradiction there in, you know, you're wanting to be an imaginative person thinking, oh, well, what if I had an organized structured thing like this? And maybe I wouldn't be as imaginative. I would say maybe you'd be more imaginative. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, maybe. it's interesting. I have- well, I mean, but it's whether I want to be imaginative or not, it's just kind of like it's it's the life I know. Yeah, it's um, your life. 
Yeah. Now, the um, the more I learn about Ayn Rand's contemporaries, either people she knew or just people who were living at the same time, the more I hear uh, some of the same, let's say, praises of Hugo or sort of individualistic type of language or stuff like that, or readings of history and the history of philosophy. So there was kind of like a lot of good stuff happening um, back then and bad stuff as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's another important lesson for students of Rand to learn is that you know, Rand was, she was not like on, on this island, like she was not like this one lone voice of reason surrounded by nothing but, um, but you know, but, e- but evil and irrationality. There, there was, there were, there, there were other people helping her along the way or, or who thought similar to her and she was impacted by it and, and that they influenced her and vice versa. So um, that's another way, similar, I think, to saying like, just, just telling children, the Greeks were the most heroic. You, you got to sort of yeah. make it real and put it yeah, into context as much as you can. Yeah. Um, uh, we got yeah, and I would a say, super, and, go ahead. And, and Rucka, just what you were saying, it's like, Ayn, I haven't found something where Ayn Rand's like wrong. Like, no, Victor Hugo is not some genius in literature. It's like, but you don't just absorb that. You know, you go and you read and say, do I like these books? And I think that's where it goes back to self-esteem where you could potentially not like Victor Hugo. There's something in your childhood that you didn't like, you know, the, the streets of Paris, who knows? But th- the point is you got to do the work yourself. So with children, I was trying to hop over the work that say somebody like Ayn Rand did to know that in fact, the Greeks are a heroic civilization. You can't jump over the work. So, mm-hmm. you know, and again, with Ayn Rand, I would say there, is a, there are many amazing people doing great work at her time. But yeah, Ayn Rand's at a fundamental level. She's just different. Like she, she hit on the core levels of our existence of philosophy. And that's why there's such a, you know, I think a justified respect that needs to be due to her because, you know, Maria Montessori is focused on children in reality. Ayn Rand is focused on everything, like the foundation. Mm-hmm. So I just think she's, she's at a different level, but I agree with you. It's, I didn't really start to understand objectivism until I started to read everybody because mm-hmm. I didn't have yeah. a contrast. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so like Ma- uh, Maria Montessori saying that, like, like you said, there's no imagination without like reality first, something like that. Um, so like, that sounds like it's got some sort of uh, parallel to, to Rand's philosophy, yeah. kind of like she rejects the rationalists, right? The whole, like the people who do, dedu- they create this abstract system. Um, yeah. and they say, I think therefore I am, but if you never observed anything with your five senses, at least one of your five senses, you'd have nothing to deduce with. You'd have nothing to contemplate, you know? So, uh, yep. uh so, somebody born with no, none of their senses working, like they're basically a vegetable. They're not sitting there in their mind, thinking pure Man. platonic, beautiful thoughts and solving math equations They're They got nothing to no nothing to dream about even. Um, yeah. Yep. We got Boaz Galil with $2 saying, Jesse, can you give tips for a parent of infant six months old? Yeah, I think, you know, and I have an, I have an eight month old right now. So, and I mean, I've, I've helped to develop infant programs and so forth. So one thing I would say is observe. So this goes back to that kind of Maria Montessori was a scientist. And I think Ayn Rand in a, in a deep sense, she's kind of thinking like a scientist. Let's observe first. That's, that's our first thing. So with your infant, get off the computer for a moment. Don't read my stuff. Don't go read anybody's stuff and just sit there for an hour and observe. What are they doing? Do they start to cry after a minute or five minutes? You know, what happens if you leave your child crying for one minute and you walk out of the room and come back in? Are they still crying? Just start with observation, get rid of all judgment. So I, this was difficult for me coming from, I think a heavily uh, judgment again. I'm going to say movement. I, Ayn Rand to me is just like I, it's very rare. I find something where I'm just like, oh, this is hogwash or something. But stop. We're talking about children here. We can't bring the judgment. So all that you've learned about infants, all that I've stop. Go into the room and maybe even take out a sheet and just call it observation. On the left, put factual observations. On the right, you can go. He's he's tired. He's not. You don't know if he's tired. What is he? He's, he's yawning. That's a factual observation. Then on the right, as in terms of your emotional judgment or understand, you could say he's tired. So just do, do that one activity. And I think you'd find, you'd find yourself going, wow, I, I'm judging a lot or I'm putting things on the child versus going, he's wiping his nose right now. Get, get those facts, those just observations down. You'd be amazed at what you'll find. So that's, the, that's one, just, I would say, if you start with that, you've just gained tremendously. Unless, Boaz, you've already done that and then ask me again and I'll give you something else, you know? 
Yeah, that sounds like uh, he's a good dad. Uh, so he'll be fine. <laughs> the kid, kid will turn out great. I don't know. But uh, Metija with two euros. Thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, I guess uh, anything else uh, you think we should touch upon and discuss? Uh, or Because I'm out of questions at the moment and we don't have any more super chats. Did we address uh, sort of the fundamentals, the fundaments, you think? Well, I mean, maybe I'd ask you, since you've you know thought a little bit about Montessori, is there or even children, is there anything that you know you're thinking to yourself, oh, this sounds like BS, or I, I don't know about this, or is there anything you know that that comes to your mind that's still like lingering with children, any topic? I think I, I sort of share the trepidation that some of the Russian parents uh, that you've worked with have expressed, and I know Russian yeah. is sort of um, a a, a <laughs> generic for just like not uh not liberal american just or whatever not just like you yeah. know from another ethnic ethnic background where they they're they're from the more like just just work and grunt through it uh type of mentality it's hard for me to imagine mm. um you know strong adults strong adults of good character like really committed to their principles who are um you know, who are not not going to be easily pushed around and but mm -hmm. but and and very creative, just like that sort of uh, it's hard for me to imagine that type of person coming from a good upbringing where they were taught to think and to act and to do all of these things. But yeah. just because I can't easily imagine it doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means I haven't yeah. been through that and seen that. I mean, and, and I'll tell you, it's not just the Russians, you know, the Russians, mm -hmm. it's obviously there are some Russians out there who are like, hey, this is wonderful. But I had the same feeling and I'm not Russian. So, you know, obviously it's not the Russians. So I don't <laughs> I want to get past that on my end. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, so what I would say is this. For, I would say, first of all, that dad ended up being like the most Montessori, like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And before that, he almost came up and like he, he almost looked like he wanted to fight me. You know what I'm saying? So he had a transformation himself. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is the type of people like I've learned now, I moved to Kansas for a couple of years, and this is very non the Montessori movement, but I met some Marines and I learned, my wife and I learned how to defend ourselves. And I mean, defend ourselves like, you know, I can, I, with, a, with a gun. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very rational to know how to defend yourself. And now and that doesn't mean I think everybody's going to come at me and I'm ready. So I think in a true Montessori fashion, you would learn how to defend yourself. So just as I said, these grace and courtesy lessons, if somebody bumps in, he's, oh, you know, you bumped into me, but what if he starts to push you? You, ah! you know, you just lose your mind. Or you, you know, in this case, you can call the teacher. Just like for us, you don't immediately, if, if somebody's like just robbed your house and ran off, you don't chase them down the road with a gun, you call the police. So the tough guy is going to chase him down the road and potentially get killed himself. So I think the tough guy is actually uh, not as selfish as you might believe or not as strong as you might believe. He's acting on some insecurities that he has. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is from a young age, you help to develop. How do I deal with somebody who comes at me? You, you know, a four-year-old. Four-year-old's not a bully, but they might come at you. They might bite you. What do you do? And then as you get older, I'm not averse to, you know, helping teenagers learn how to physically defend themselves or even younger, maybe jujitsu. You know, mm. so I think you can be. I don't, have you read the novel Shane by Jack Schaefer? No. Oh, it's an awesome, just short little okay. book. But Shane is, mm -hmm. a I think, you know, Rourke's probably the greatest example here. You mm. know, I don't think of Rourke as a wuss, but he also doesn't come across as that macho guy that maybe you have in your mind right now. That I, yeah, be well, no, I think I think Rand's heroes are a good example of uh, a proper hero. So I, I didn't mean just like in the physical sense, being not be getting pushed around, but just you know, someone who's not not easily manipulated. You know, yeah, like yeah. someone someone could be like a genuinely honest person, but you know, let's say a beautiful woman comes into his life and she completely takes advantage of him, and you know, obviously a, a woman could get taken advantage of as well. Um, yeah. so like I, I, I sort of, I struggle to, um, in, uh, envision that a, a kid with in this type of environment, who's like taught in, by good people and like, he's not yeah, really exposed to any sort of, um, shitty people. And yeah. then is a, a, equipped later in life to know what to do when shitty people show up. I see what you're saying. And I, I respect your cursing at this point too. So I appreciate a little, you know, that, but I would say that. If that's the concern that you're not, you're not isolated in this room of only like peaceful people. I mean, at, at four or five or even six or seven, if, if somebody pushes you, like that's the equivalent of somebody mugging you, or that's the equivalent of somebody, or let's say a child comes up and goes, 
oh, I, I'm, I'm going to be finished in two minutes on my activity and then you can have it. And two right. hours later, he's still using the activity. What do you, how do you handle that? Because that's basic, you know, in a way it's fraud and at a child's level, you know, there's something fraudulent going on. And that's what is aided to be developed in a Montessori classroom. And then on the, the deepest sense, I would say, as I started out with Montessori, is it's kind of like guided self-development. So if you have a strong sense of self, at a fundamental level, what you're attempting to do is go, I'm not going to bring in random insecurities and emotions to deal with this woman who's hot. I've got to stop myself and go, yeah, she, man, this girl is hot, but you know what? She's pretty She's not, she's pretty dumb. She hasn't really said anything that's actually attractive to me intellectually, but I am getting wowed by this woman physically. And you need to go back to your self-esteem and say, would I really want that? So I, I, I get what you're saying. The strength we're talking about at a fundamental level is not just, you know, I, if somebody punched me, I could dodge the punch. It's a spiritual way too. If somebody comes at me with some BS, I can call it and see it. And I think mm -hmm. part of that is developed in Montessori. And then I just got to be direct here. Montessori is not like the end all I, you know, these kids are right. There's parents Montessori is an approach I'd say to life with children. So if your child just goes to Montessori classroom and then is exposed to the broader culture at your house, I don't, I can't predict what he's going to turn out like, but I can tell you with that Montessori background, he's got a certain basis that he would not have had otherwise most likely that's, that's mm -hmm. all I can say. But like you were kind of talking about throughout, you can't really predict hundred percent kind of what's going to happen. And we can't go back and go, Oh, if only I would have switched. It's like, let's deal with what we have out there in the yeah. world. Right. And uh, to sort of a call back to that whole, like, there's no imagination without like experience, something like that. Like there's no uh, lessons, there's no character without experience. So at the end of the day, no, no type of education or, or, or parenting could shield you from the types of, uh, dangers out there you'll only really learn about by going out into the world you'll only really gain uh, character by actually getting out there and you know that you know in the case you know in the so using this archetype of a man getting manipulated by a beautiful woman he's got to learn for himself that you know a beautiful woman is not god and mm -hmm. she's she's nothing to uh to let you to trade in your independent judgment for. So yeah, experience getting yeah. out there living. And, and it sounds like Montessori doesn't encourage that. It's ultimately. Yeah I, uh, yeah. I like what you just said, because I think you raised the point that's really important is that these things are going to happen no matter how strong you are inside. Like eventually something's going to happen where you slip up or, you, you know, you, you were thinking too much about what other people think, like something's going to happen. And then what do you do with that is what's important. And if I learn from it, go, Oh, I got to watch out for that. You, you can't, you can only recreate so much. We're not going to, you know, recreate your best friend getting shot and dying in a Montessori classroom. And then you have to grow from it. Like that would be insane. But mm -hmm. if that happens, as you're saying, like, that's the real world. And how do we grow from that? You know, do we, mm -hmm. do we, do we soak in the sadness for 30 years? Or do we say, man, there's some bad stuff going on. Let's figure out how I can get better. I mean, and, and then in, I would say this, embrace the, embrace the sadness. I don't, I'm not about pushing away emotions. I think it's very important to know what you feel and allow yourself to feel any emotion, whether good, bad, um, Peter Keating type emotion, if you have it, like feel that first and then try to get rid of it. Don't push it away. So I just want to, you know, anything that happens in life. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. We're just about out of time, but Bonnie is asking, is DEI common in current Montessori culture? <laughs> what, what is that? Yeah, I get, I, that's uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. I get an uh -huh. email, I mean, once a week for somebody to come on my podcast to discuss, you know, oh, DEI in the classroom, inclusivity in the classroom, race train in the classroom. And that at a core level is, ex is explicitly, in my view, anti-Montessori. However, the movement in Montessori has very much embraced that. And I think it's, I, I haven't discussed it on my podcast because I just, I think we have better things to discuss, but uh, that is not healthy. And I would not say that's Montessori, no. All right. But, it, but well, the movement has embraced that. The Montessori movement at the top levels, in, in particularly in America, have embraced DEI and that that whole uh, realm. Wow. Well, it sounds like um, the influence of thinkers like Rand would uh, would help shield a movement like the Montessori movement from such anti individualistic, uh, yeah. anti even anti rational ideas. But um, all right, more to get into another time. Uh, this is a great conversation. Thanks for coming on. And wh what is the name of your podcast, by the way? In the Montessori Education Podcast. 
straightforward. Yeah, pretty simple. All right. Well, there's 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 one Montessori education uh, brand that the DEI people will not be able to uh, appropriate. All right. Yeah. Um, unless they make you an offer, I don't know. That could could have. I know if it's out. big enough, Rock. I'm going yeah. with it. I'm jumping. Sure. So absolutely. I mean. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, yeah, coming up today. Me. Absolutely. Coming up at 7 p.m. UK time in a few minutes, it's the Fountainhead Book Club open to ARC UK members. And the session will also be live streamed to YouTube members. So uh, become a member. Links in the chat and in the description. All right. We'll be back tomorrow for the Daily Objective. Thanks again, Jesse. And goodbye.